How are you? How are you? I'm good, thank you. How about you? Fine, thanks. Really happy to have you here. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. It's good to be here. <laughs> I, I, it would be nice if uh, we could do this in person, but uh, maybe soon. Maybe soon. Maybe soon. You know, you're always welcome in Mexico City, whenever you want. Thank you. Well, yeah, first of all, for the people that aren't familiar with you and your work, can you tell us a little bit about you? Because as I was doing the introduction, I was like, I don't know how to introduce Jaron because he's a writer, he's an entrepreneur, he's a businessman, he's a columnist, he's an activist, he's everything, he's Superman. I, I do a lot of things. I do a lot of things, no question. Yeah, I mean, I, I was, uh, you know, I have uh, dedicated the last... 21 years, really, to promoting, you know, the ideas of Ayn Rand and uh, to her philosophy, objectivism. Uh, I did that uh, for 17 years as the CEO of the Ayn Rand Institute, and I'm still the chairman of the board over there. Uh, and now I have a, a podcast, I, um, which uh, Yaron Brooks Show, which you can find on YouTube and on uh, iTunes and on all the podcasting apps. Uh, and I have... Um, you know, I'm, I'm active somewhat on social media. I, I'm a public speaker. So I travel around the world when there's no COVID uh, to give talks about objectivism, about morality of capitalism, about uh, why, co why COVID is proof that we should, you know, shrink government and give them less power um, and how, how disastrous what they've done. I, I defend financial markets uh, and financiers. So I, I talk about a lot of different topics a wide array of topics, but all from the perspective of the philosophy of objectivism. So I speak around the world, I do a lot of interviews, um, and uh, I write books, I write articles, and I've got a bunch of different projects promoting these kind of ideas. And then on the, kind of that's one part of my life. Another part of my life is, uh, I, I w before I took the job at the Ironman Institute, I was a finance professor. And while I was a finance professor, I started a, a hedge fund and uh, that was in 1998. And uh, originally we were working for another hedge fund, but now over the last 11 years, we've had our own hedge fund. And, and uh, so I'm, a, I'm the managing partner at a small hedge fund uh, that, uh, that manages money. Uh, so uh, that keeps me busy. So I'm uh, always kind of juggling multiple things that I am doing. Perfect. And I live now in Puerto Rico, which is strange, right? <laughs> okay, we'll go to Puerto Rico right now. But uh, first of all, I think that many people aren't as familiar as they could or should be about objectivism. So for people that haven't heard the term, what is objectivism and why do you support so much and spread the word on this kind of way of thinking? Okay. Well, objectivism is a philosophy. Uh, it's a philosophy uh, developed by Ayn Rand uh, uh, in her books that m maybe some of the listeners are familiar with. Atlas Shrugged, uh, The Fountainhead, The Virtue of Selfishness, Capitalism, non known Ideal. All books that, by the way, are available in Spanish. Uh, they all, everything's been translated and there are websites in Spanish about her and her ideas and essays and everything's really been translated. Uh, so uh, I encourage people to read because uh, whatever they hear from me, is just going to be, you know, a, a, a very small, uh, very small, and I think uh, un relatively uninteresting as compared to what she writes and, and, and the quality of her writing and the power of her writing. Um, objectivism is a philosophy she defined for living on earth. It's a philosophy that's supposed to guide you as an individual to live the best life that you can live while you're alive on this planet. Um, you only have one life. Uh, you have one shot at it. Ayn Rand's philosophy is about making the most of that one life. And she, she basically starts uh, with a, the fundamental idea of, you know, how to deal with the world out there. And, 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 you know, maybe this sounds obvious to many people, but philosophically it's not. She says the world is what it is. It, it, a is A. Things are what they are. You don't make them up. They're not a product of your consciousness. Wishing doesn't make things true. Praying doesn't make things true. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, being superstitious or any kind of mysticism doesn't make it true. Things are what they are. Reality is what it is. Um, and you have the tool to know it. 
And this is the tool you must cultivate if you want to live a good life. And that tool is reason. You have a mind. Your mind is designed to give you information about the world as it is so that you can figure out how to live in it. So your basic means of survival, your basic means of thriving in the world is your own rational capacity. It's reason. It's not, not emotion, not revelation, not any other kind of mechanism. No shortcuts. Knowledge uh, requires reasoning. It requires observation of reality, integration of that knowledge, uh, and, and, and understanding of the world. And then, of course, it's only individuals who can reason. Uh, groups can't reason any more than groups can think or groups can eat. Um, groups can't eat for you and a group can't think for you. Your, your responsibility in life is to think and to figure out the best course for your life. And, the, and therefore, uh, the, the, the human individual, the individual, each one of us is an end in itself. Your purpose in your life is to live the best life for you using your mind to figure out the values necessary for your survival and for your thriving and ultimately for your happiness. That the moral purpose of life, the moral purpose of life is, is to be happy. It's not to sacrifice and die. It's not to serve others. It's not to live for the group or the collective or, 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 or something external of you. It's the moral purpose of your life is you. It's your successful living. And the only political system that allows you the freedom to think for yourself and act for yourself and pursue the values that you deem necessary for your own happiness, the only political system that allows that is a political system that respects rights, individual rights, freedom, that respects freedom, the freedom of an individual to make choices and to act on them. And that political system is capitalism. It's the system in which government is limited to the protection of individual rights, that's all it does, and in which we are all free, free of coercion, free of force, free of authority, to pursue our own life and our own values. That's objectivism. Uh, and why do, I, why do I actively pursue it? Well, because it changed my life, it, it, and I want to live in a world with lots of objectivists. I want to live in a world of happy people, productive people, uh, successful people, uh, value, uh, you know, people who are values oriented, people who love with passion, uh, people who love their life with passion, who love the people they love with passion, love their work with passion. I think that's what it takes to be happy. And I want to live in that world. And the only way, since nobody else is doing the work, the only way I can imagine living in that world is going out there and trying to convince people to adopt these ideas. Right. What do you think is the line between a uh, looking out for yourself and being selfish about um, what, it, not about what others want, but about uh, hurting others with your actions. Where is that line? Well, I don't think there is a line because I don't think hurting others, now it depends what you mean by hurting, but, but, but physically, let's say damaging others, I don't think that's ever in your self-interest unless it's in self-defense. And then you're not really hurting others. You're just protecting yourself. So there is no, uh, my life is, the purpose of my life is to live the best life I can. Hurting other people doesn't help me. Uh, stealing from other people doesn't help me. Lying to other people doesn't help me. Not in the full sense. Not what you understand what human life requires. Human life requires me to be honest. Human life requires me not to steal. Because I, I lose all self-esteem. What, how can I regard myself uh, if I view productiveness, if I view working, having a career, producing as valuable, which I think every good human being should, how can I respect myself and then if I go and steal and get stuff, not by producing, but by stealing? I lose self-esteem. I lose respect for myself and I lose the capacity to be happy. So it's damaging to you to lie, steal, cheer, cheat, and 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 you know, use physical force against other people. So that's the line. The line is don't violate other people's rights because it's not in your self-interest to violate other people's rights, partially because it involves something dishonest that you're doing, partially also involves, I want to live in a world in which my rights are not violated. What kind of message am I sending the world if I violate other people's rights? 
that I'm not serious, that it's okay to violate my rights. So I want to live in a world in which rights are not violated means I should not, I should not violate others' rights. John, um, I, I think that if someone kind of gives the idea or personifies the idea of globalization right now, it's you because you were born in Israel, then you <laughs> moved and worked and studied in USA where you said you mentioned the importance of capitalism for your own uh, political uh, uh, views. Uh, now you live in Puerto Rico. How has the journey been for you? How, uh, what have you learned uh, by being born in Israel that you won't if you had been born in USA? But at the same time, what did you learn when you went to USA that you won't learn in Israel and and so on? And I know you give uh, public speakings around the world, and I'm guessing that gives you a little bit of taste of every single culture and mindset and their own views on political things, economical things, etc. I mean, it's hard to tell, um, you know, because life in Israel was very different than life in America, and, and particularly growing up, uh, you, you know, Israel was relatively poor, Israel was very socialist, Israel was constantly under threat, uh, growing up, uh, there was wars all the time, um, and uh, terrorist attacks, and, and you grew up with that, so, I, you know, how did that shape me exactly? It's hard to tell, and, and those are kind of experiences that I wouldn't have had if I'd grown up in America. I probably grew up faster, matured faster, uh, and probably gained a greater appreciation of my life because I'd lived under threat. Um, it also was a place in which you could grow up and be left alone. There wasn't a lot of what they call in America helicopter parents, where the parents hovered over you and you would, you know, you got home and you went outside and you played with your friends and you saw your parents when you came to dinner. Nobody asked you what you were doing, where you were going, you know, there were no phones, there was no, you just did your thing. And, and you, you, there was a, it was a very independent childhood, which, which was terrific. You know, and, and so it was a great, it, it was actually a great place to grow up. I enjoyed growing up there. But once I reached adulthood, I realized that, um, realized that, it was very constraining in terms of uh, the opportunities. Uh, there was limited freedom uh, and, uh, you know, economically there were limited opportunities. It was small. Uh, it's a small country, but also it's a very collectivist country. And that means everybody's in your life and everybody's involved and everybody thinks you should sacrifice and give to them and devote your time to them. And, And I needed to get away from the collectivism. So to me, leaving Israel was obvious once I'd read Ayn Rand and decided my life was, was what was meaningful because the collectivism was too bad. It was too harsh. It wasn't the security. It wasn't the terrorism. It wasn't the war. It wasn't even the, the socialism because that was in decline once I was an adult in Israel. It was really the collectivism, the sense that everybody's your cousin and everybody is in your life. Um, I love, you know, so I went to America and America, you, you have a, you definitely have a sense of freedom that you don't have anywhere else. Even though in reality, you have less freedom than you think. And even though in reality, the government is everywhere and regulating and controlling and listening and, but there's still a sense of freedom in the United States. It certainly was when I moved there, um, 33 years ago, 33 and a half years ago now. Um, I think that freedom is slowly with a way I think that that sense that Americans have of freedom has slowly gone away, but it certainly used to be. It's why people emigrate to America. It's, it's because it still is a land of opportunity. It still is relatively free. There's still, it, it still has a certain vibe to it. That's exciting and fun and, and, and where you can do, you can do, you can do things and you can achieve and you can succeed and you can build up, build a life. Um, so yeah, I benefited enormously from living in America. It, it, it's, it's, uh, I'm glad I made the move. I'm sad to see America in decline. Uh, but look, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of immigration because I, I think everybody should have the opportunity when they grow, when, when, when they grow up to decide where do I want to live? Um, uh, what's, what would be the best life that I could possibly have? Um, 
you know, in the world out there. And why am I limited to where I was born? Right? Where I was born might really be bad. I didn't choose to be born in Israel. You didn't choose to be born in Mexico. I assume you were born in Mexico. Now, just the way you accident of, you know, accident. It's complete chance. And so uh, uh, why not? Freedom means having choices and, and not being forced. So why shouldn't people be able to decide my life would be better off in X place? And, and that's the kind of world ultimately I'd like to live in. You know, it was the world to some extent in the 19th century. You could move around. There were no passports. You could go anywhere. That's how America was settled. Millions and millions and millions of people came to America. Nobody, nobody stopped them. Nobody sent them back unless they were sick or something. Um, and, and, and I think that is, that's a beautiful thing. And I think globalization is amazing. The fact that I can buy products from made anywhere in the world that I can in a sense, trade with people everywhere. Uh, we have division of labor, what Adam Smith talked about 250 years ago. We now have on a global scale, we have hundreds of millions of people participating in the division of labor. It, it's just it's just fantastic. There's, you know, and it's the more of that we have, the better off everybody is. You've had many professions, and I'm guessing each one uh, helped you build some skills that help you in the next one and so on, or I don't know if you juggled uh, many of them at the same time, but since we're talking about doing what makes you happy and everything, John, what's the profession that you think has made you happiest doing at the time? Well, it's what I do today. I mean, I love what <laughs> I do today. I, I, I'm independent. I get to I get to promote Ayn Rand's ideas, but without having to manage people in an organization and all of that. I can just do it in my way. I get, I get to travel around the world talking to people and, and uh, meeting people. I mean, that's how we met. I, I was in Mexico City two or three years ago. I can't remember yeah. now. Um, and uh, with Gloria Alvarez, of course. And, yeah. and um, Great things, and, Gloria. Uh, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and, you know, and, and so I get to meet amazing people. I get to do amazing things. I get to uh, sit here in, in my home in Puerto Rico and, and talk and get, in a sense, get paid for that, um, uh, w w which is great. And then, of course, I can, um, uh, you know, I also have my financial uh, side where I can uh, do interesting things uh, in, in financial markets and, and get, get compensated for that. So uh, right now, my life is kind of as good as it gets in a sense because I, I do what I want to do. I don't have to do things I don't want to do. Uh, I, I, you know, I, my income is good from all the th different things that I do. And, um, and it's, and, and it, you know, it's, it's fun. It's, it's exciting. Uh, you were talking about immigration and the fact that, as you mentioned, you don't choose where you uh, are born, but maybe we should give people the choice to choose where they want to live. Um, in your experience and as an immigrant yourself, uh, what does immigration and what does the mix of different cultures, different races, different uh, mindsets uh, bring together to the table that just being everyone from the same place, with the same context, with the same experiences, just doesn't? Well, I mean, I think in the end, it really depends, right? So it, it, immigration is a plus if the, the, the culture of the place you're immigrating to the fundamental values of it that made it attractive to begin with are maintained and sustained. That is, if the people who come embrace the melting pot in, in, American, in American terminology, embrace the idea that they will accept the culture, they will embrace the, the principles that made it, and then bring their own flavor to it, which I think they do. So, you know, obviously the food is better, right? And, and, uh, and uh, you, you, get, you get much more... But it's also that people did bring different perspectives. They bring uh, different ideas. More people is always better in a sense than less people because there are more minds thinking about how to solve problems. If they have different experiences, they might bring different approaches to solving a problem than maybe uh, you know the, the, the people who are, or are part of the status quo uh, you know, can't think outside of a particular box. Uh, you know, they also bring energy and excitement so 
immigrants often are passionate about the things that make a place special more than the people who grew up with it are kind of take it for granted. I think I have a better appreciation for American history, for, for American freedom, for the American founding fathers, for the American constitution, for what makes America great than 90% of Americans because I know what the alternative is in a, in a sense that they don't. I've studied the history and the founding of, this, of the country because I know, again, I know the alternatives. So I'm interested in what made America special and I know it's special. I think a lot of Americans don't know it's special. This is what they grew up with. They're patriotic, but it's empty. You know, I'm patriotic because I really believe in the country and I think it's a, it's a great country for reasons that have to do with how it was founded and kind of how it evolved. So I think immigrants bring energy, bring excitement. I mean, immigrants are typically entrepreneurs. Um, they typically care about education, so their kids get educated and, and, and the kids do well. Uh, and, they, and they typically come because they want, let's say, to America, because they want the freedom that America represents. And they become, you know, and I think, I think if America stood for something, immigrants would uh, embrace that and be even more passionate about it than Americans are. The challenge today is not immig immigrants. The challenge to American culture today is not immigrants. The challenge to American culture today is Americans. John, you started in the Ayn Rand Institute because uh, you love uh, the Ayn Rand philosophies and, and her books and everything about it. Uh, but now you are a writer yourself. What can you tell us about your books, about how they represent your way of thinking? Sure. So I have three books, all co-authored with uh, Don Watkins, who, who worked with me at the Ayn Rand Institute. Uh, well, really, four books, uh, uh, one of them with uh, Bradley Thompson, who is a professor at Clemson University. But the three books with Don, which I think represent more of, of, of my thinking, are uh, books that reflect kind of my approach to Ayn Rand's ideas, and that is applying them to particular areas that are important to me and that I have an understanding of. So the first book is really focused on capitalism, on business and capitalism, uh, on, on what are the important ideas for objectivism to have if we want to hold, if we want to change the culture, if we want to shrink government, if we want to limit our pol the pol politicians' power. So it's really, it's called Free Market Revolution, how Ayn Rand's uh, ideas can, can uh, uh, you know, uh, limit big government, right? It can limit the government, it can shrink the government. Uh, and so that's, that's a book that deals more with politics and the application of these ideas to politics. The second book is Equal is Unfair, which came from the horror that I had in realizing that Americans were coming to hate the idea of inequality for the first time and, and how the left was using inequality as this issue to try to divide Americans and to try to drive a socialist leftist, leftist agenda into the American culture. And I wrote that in response, really advocating for American kind of style individualism and how individualism is opposed to any limits on inequality and why inequality, if it arises out of freedom, if it arises out of the fact that we have different talents and different skills and different abilities and different interests and different passions, and um, is great. I mean, it, there's nothing wrong with inequality. So that equal is unfair that you can see back there. And then um, after that, I wrote a book called uh, the, the Market Finance, uh, which is really combines kind of my, my work in the financial markets with my work on philosophy, on the philosophy of Ayn Rand, and really is a moral defense of an industry that I love and an industry that I think is maligned and often uh, attacked and blamed for all the bad things in the world. And I think finance is a heroic field. And so it's a, it's a book really focused on that, on bringing this philosophy of individualism, reason, uh, egoism, and capitalism to the topic of financiers. And the fourth book, which I, I wrote with Bradley Thompson, was really an attack on neoconservatism. So again, a political book about a particular political uh, ideology, which I think, uh, particularly post 9-11, was particularly influential in America and very damaging to America 
uh, and, and really resulted in some really, really bad policies. So um, we wrote a book to, to, to attack that. So it's more at the political economic level, but always bringing in morality, always making the argument that what's really important in life is ethics. It's, it's the code of value by, by which you live, and, and that really shapes politics, economics, uh, and, and, and everything really that happens in the world out there. And if we don't have a proper moral code, and, and this is kind of my disagreement with other free market thinkers, if we don't have a proper moral code, we will never get freedom. We will never get capitalism. Capitalism depends on people embracing a morality of egoism. And as long as they don't forget about it, capitalism will never be successful in, in terms of people adopting it. What do you think in a country that's in dispute right now, like USA with the evolution and questioning of what capitalism is or should be, uh, do you think we are on the edge of the evolution of capitalism, that, that there will be a, a new step, a new progress in that, or it will be more like uh, going back to the original values of it? If you have to take a guess. Well, I don't know what you mean by evolution of capitalism. I think that we are moving away from capitalism. I, I, I think we don't have capitalism today where we have some mixed economy, some elements of capitalism of freedom, some elements of statism, a lot of statism. And that mixture is unstable. It's always, things are always moving because there are too many pressures on this mixture. It doesn't, it can't stay. It either becomes complete statism or it becomes complete capitalism. And right now we're moving towards more statism. So in my view, it's not an evolution of capitalism. The political economic system in the United States is evolving, but it's evolving towards less capitalism, more authoritarianism, more government control, uh, and, and, and more statism, whether it's fascism or socialism. That's where I think we're heading. It's going to be very difficult to turn this around. Uh, and, and it's very depressing in that sense. Uh, but there doesn't seem to be any real popular support today in America for individualism and capitalism. As an entrepreneur yourself, how has entrepreneurship evolved in USA since you started? It? What opportunities do you think have been close to entrepreneurs right now? Or, and what opportunities do you think that uh, current entrepreneurs have that that entrepreneurs from before will have killed for? I mean, I think that a knowledge about entrepreneurship has increased a lot. There's, there's a lot of knowledge, a lot of research, a lot of books, a lot of courses, a lot of degrees you can get in entrepreneurship. I, I mean, so it's, there's a lot more knowledge about how to start a business, what are the steps to take, um, and, and what are the obstacles and what are the, what are the challenges that you're going to face. So... Um, Certainly, uh, you know, uh, that, it, that exists. In, in some ways, it's easier to start a business today because there's lots of capital. So the, there's a whole industry to support entrepreneurs, think venture capitalists. I mean, when I moved to the U.S. in 87, the venture capitalist community was robust, but it was really just starting. I mean, venture capital is a new area. It started in the 70s and the and, and 80s kind of was maturing. But today... The hundreds of venture capitalists, they're very good. They're good at what they do. They, they're good at identifying great companies. So capital is more available. And, and even if you're young and inexperienced, they are now venture capitalists that specialize in funding young and inexperienced entrepreneurs. So, so it's, it, in that sense, it's, it's much, much easier to raise capital. But it's also interesting that entrepreneurs today, particularly in technology, you don't need a lot of capital because uh, much of what you do has... You know, you can put on the cloud. You you don't have to buy a lot of hardware. You, it's it's much much easier to to get a company off the ground, get a product into the marketplace in the technology space today than it was 20, 30 years ago. Uh, so entrepreneurship, there's more knowledge, more capital, and and it's cheaper to do. I mean, I'd say on the on the downside, uh, what, what's what's worse is there's more regulations, more controls. More avenues blocked, more government intervention um, than there was 30, 40, 50 years ago. So, but overall, I still think that, that there's no shortage of opportunities 
for entrepreneurs who have ideas, who are willing to work hard and willing to really devote their life to succeeding, there's no limit to the opportunities that they have uh, even today. Yeah, and to start wrapping this up, to every guest in the Keep It Up show, we ask them to, to wrap it up uh, three do's and three don'ts for entrepreneurs. Basically, three things that they should do and three things that they shouldn't do. What are your three do's and three don'ts? Well, the, the, I'd say the first do is do it. You know, don't sit on your hands. Don't wait for somebody else. Take your ownership over your own life and your own career and, and just go and do it. Um, uh, so I'd say, I'd say that's, that is, uh, number one, uh, you know, the other, the others are, you know, be smart about think, you know, use your mind, uh, be passionate, but always remember that you're going to be successful if you think it through. And when you act just on emotion, that's when you get in trouble. So, so I have a plan, think it through, figure out what you want to achieve and what the path you're going to. And then don't be afraid. Uh, don't be afraid to ask um, for advice, help, capital. Uh, I know a lot of entrepreneurs that say, I, you know, I don't want venture capital. They're going to tell me what to do. Yeah, but they're also going to bring knowledge and experience that particularly for first-time entrepreneurs, you just don't have. So, so, so do it and, and, uh, and, and, you know, go for it. I'd say in terms of don't is the, the main one is don't be afraid to fail. Don't be afraid to fail. Uh, failure is part of being an entrepreneur. Uh, every great entrepreneur has failed. Uh, and, uh, but have the right approach to failure. It, you know, failure should be a learning opportunity. It should be an opportunity to figure out how to do it better next time. Uh, you know, don't listen to other, don't listen to other people against your judgment. At the end of the day, Follow your dreams and follow your judgment, right? So get advice, talk to other people, um, invite guidance. But at the end of the day, you have to make the decisions for yourself. So don't, don't sell out on your principles. Um, yeah, and don't give up. It's going to be hard work. It's going to be hard work. There's, uh, and, and be ready for that. And, uh, and don't give up when you, when you face the obstacles. The obstacles can be you know, can be overcome. Perfect. John, if anyone wanted to learn a little bit more about you, read your books, uh, watch your show, how can they find you on social media? Sure. So I have a website, youronbookshow.com. I'm on social media on Facebook. Just put my name in and on Twitter. And I think on every other platform as well. But those are the two that I mainly use. Um, I have... Um, My show is on primarily on YouTube, uh, so you can go to your Ron Book show on YouTube, and uh, you can subscribe there, and, and that's great. Uh, I, I have, I do four, sometimes five shows a week, so there's tons of content. All my lectures are up there, all my interviews are up there, so there's a ton of content, uh, hundreds, maybe thousands by this point, of videos, long and short, and every variety possible. Um, and, uh, of course, those of you interested in Ayn Rand, go to AynRand.org, which is the Ayn Rand Institute website, and, and, and go get her books, Atlas Shrugged and the Fountainhead, and read them. And you can find all my books on Amazon. So uh, just put my name on Amazon, and you will find them. Perfect. Well, yeah, and I want to thank you a lot for your time. We were really glad to have you here. And as we say on this program, keep it up. Thank you. I appreciate it.